Hello and welcome to Money Matters. Hong Kong has been an international financial hub for decades, but isn't considered an arts and culture center, which is why as far back as 1998, the Tourism Board and then CE Tung Chi Wa proposed the formation of the West Kowloon Cultural District. More than 20 years later, the doors to the M Plus and Palace Museums have finally opened to the public in the hopes of making Hong Kong more attractive to tourists. Unfortunately, traveling here continues to be prohibitive. The Palace Museum opened its doors on July 3rd, featuring almost 1,000 pieces on loan from Beijing's Palace Museum, over 150 of which are classified as national treasures. People go to London, New York, not just because of making money. They go there for, you know, very, um, these exclusive or very high level of, you know, these performance or exhibitions. And this is one area that I think Hong Kong has been always been lacking. You know, some people refer to Hong Kong as a desert uh, for us in culture. So it has taken us a long time, you know, almost 20 years. Bernard Chan, chairman of the Palace Museum Board, is hoping that the makeover of Hong Kong as an international arts and culture destination will bring it on more equal footing as New York and London, also financial centers but with huge offerings of art and culture. We do now have the hardware and so I think for the first time we can now really can build this ecosystem, the art and cultural uh, ecosystem in Hong Kong. It will still take time because you know, we only have the so-called hardware, but we still need the software. And not just an artist, musician, but we need the whole, the whole lot, including installations to uh, curatorships and you name it. And also the audience. We need to build the audience space, uh, not just local, but international as well. Now, of course, uh, the timing of all this has not been that good. Bad timing indeed. M Plus opened last November only to be shut from January until the third week of April. Despite that, 800,000 people have already visited the museum so far. Bernard says that once the borders are open, he expects more people to visit, especially as other venues open up. One way or the other, it will finish. So I have no doubt the museums in Hong Kong will be a big draw for tourists from nearby here to even to uh, the regions. The more important thing is we do have the market. And it's not just talking about the 7 million Hong Kong people. Now, there's a rising 300 to 400 million middle class uh, Chinese just across the border. So now with uh, Palace Museum, Amplus Museum, and all the other uh, arts and cultures offerings in Hong Kong, I think first time, you know, we can actually keep people in Hong Kong for a few days. The Palace Museum has arrangements with 70 museums worldwide, meaning people in the region can easily travel to Hong Kong to see these world-class collections. I see this as actually a great dialogue with the world. Because we're not just going to feature Chinese art, right? We're going to also feature Western art here as well. So it's Western civilization with Chinese civilization. So we hope that this will be a, a Hong Kong, and that's exactly what Hong Kong is about. You know, we are right in that crossroad, so we can actually play that whole East and West meet in Hong Kong. In 2018, tourism accounted for 4.5% of Hong Kong's GDP and employed a quarter of a million people, representing 6.6% of total employment. Since COVID, incoming tourists have dropped by over 95 percent, according to government statistics. The impact of this is seen on GDP, unemployment and business closures. This is actually just a little less than the finance and insurance industry in terms of employment. So you can see the comparison of how many people are employed in the tourism industry and how many livelihoods have been disrupted through the yeah. pandemic. Janet Pao, economist and executive director of the Asia Business Council, says adding arts and culture as a draw to tourists has a multiplier effect on the economy. If you look at the whole cultural and creative industries, uh, the government says that the 
share of GDP that the cultural and, uh, and, and creative industries will take up is about 5% of GDP of Hong Kong. But I think you have to think about both the core arts and culture production and also some of the supporting industries. So for instance, uh, rental, events, retail, information services, for instance, including these supporting industries, it really is a cluster. So I would say that the museums and the district itself should create a multiplier. According to government statistics, visitors staying overnight in Hong Kong spend 10 times more money than same-day visitors. The average number of days tourists stayed in Hong Kong pre-pandemic was two to four days. If we could get them to stay one more day and visit some of these arts and cultural attraction, and maybe some of the local attractions, which I think uh, Hong Kong just has a lot of unique local attractions, uh, even local artists, uh, local craftsmen. Stanley Market has been a regular shopping stop for tourists to Hong Kong since the 1980s. But since the pandemic, the lanes are empty and at least 50% of the shops have shut down. If it was before 1997 or before 2000, there were so many people that you couldn't even stick a needle between them. People were all crammed together even if you wanted to walk to the front of the street to buy food or get a car. Even though it should only take three minutes, it would take at least ten because of how many people there were. Amy Chung has had her shop in Stanley Market for 33 years. Back in the day, Amy says it was possible to make up to $10,000 in a single day. Now, there are days when she says she makes nothing, at best $300. She still opens the shop every day, although these days not until 11 a.m. Every day, the entire time that I'm here, I feel like I'm dreaming. I don't believe in myself. People say that everyone in Stanley has depression. Despite this, she doesn't want to close her shop. I have been working for a long time. I used to have savings, but now I'm old in my 60s, so it's not easy to find a job. I also can't bear to leave because since I have been working here since I was young. I have a lot of memories myself at Stanley because all of our business was from foreigners. Sometimes I think of people that visit from Singapore and they visit again the next year and bring their friends and people from overseas. Zachary Au has been working in Stanley Market for almost 30 years. He started working summers as a teen. Before. Just for example, like one counter, one proof like this, they can make 8,000 to a million, I mean, uh, I mean the 10,000 a day. Used to be the best, I mean, the tourist is quite, quite good, I mean, busy, especially Japanese, they can spend a lot of money, yeah. And then today, what's it like? <laughs> big, big change. <laughs> Maybe only 99% drop. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Yeah, even sometimes it's still. <laughs> Zach reopened his own shop about 12 years ago, doing calligraphy and selling crystals and other accessories. Since the pandemic, things have been tough. He even took on part-time work at one point. Just delivery. <laughs> More easier. <laughs> and make money. <laughs> After here, then I can go to city and do the day for you. He sells to more locals these days and he's expanded his business online. I try to change not only tourists, maybe local people or overseas online. Yeah, I keep keep touching for my uh, regular customer. They, luckily, they still order from overseas. Most busy time on Christmas time and uh, before Chinese New Year because they, I have some order on, from the overseas online. Yeah, they will try to order for Christmas gift and a Chinese New Year gift. Both Zachary and Amy are hoping to see a return of tourists with borders opened. I think Stanley already is very good for sightseeing. It's very, very beautiful place in Hong Kong. 
very relaxing. You can have uh, Western food, Chinese food, even have shopping. Financial hub, shopping destination, and now soon to be arts and culture destination. But Hong Kong is still suffering from a brain drain. Bernard is hoping that Hong Kong's reinvention can help reverse this. We should not just look at arts and culture by itself, but how arts and, arts and culture can help the entire Hong Kong as a city will allow us to be you know, competitive. Because the future of a city like Hong Kong requires talent, talent retention. And we need to draw the best talent from the world. It's not just how much money you make in that city that draw people. If the family is going to move to Hong Kong, it's the arts and culture offerings, right? Because these families, they have choices. They can relocate to anywhere they want. But, you know, to be able to keep Hong Kong competitiveness, we need to have all these offerings. And arts and culture is a very important component of it. For now, Hong Kong is a city waiting to open and show the world it has even more to offer after COVID. Coming up, how the mainland preserves cultural heritage and how businesses are benefiting from it. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Matters. In Guangzhou, mainland authorities have promoted the intangible cultural heritage of the Liwan district. The program supports people who revitalize the area and sustain its cultural heritage. Alice Khan reports that some have turned this work into successful businesses. Shiguan is an ancient town in Guangzhou. Now it's called Liwan District. A trading enclave is located on its southern shore. It is rich in traditional culture. Many heritage buildings are still standing. For example, Bruce Lee's ancestor's house is located here. This is a traditional Siguan residence. Bruce Lee's father used to live here. So, this is the ancestral residence of Bruce Lee. He himself had never lived here, but this is a typical Siguan house with specific characteristics. How can we tell? Firstly, the sliding door is the major feature of a Siguan mansion. This is Anning Road. The architecture of the arcades is unique to this area, and the structures along the road are well preserved. Wu used to live in this kind of residence when he was a child. I am a native of Siguan. I was born and lived in this kind of residence. When I was a kid, I loved to play with the sliding door. I climbed up and down on the door. In the 90s, Taiho Road was demolished and turned into the new Hongwo Road. Since then, we didn't dwell in this kind of house. This architecture doesn't just bring us a memory. We are also very attached to it. In 2016, the Liwan District government approved a preservation plan for Shiguan's traditional architecture and culture. The government didn't make huge changes to the town. It was well preserved and renamed as Yongqing Fan. During the preservation work of Yongqing Fan, they determined to keep it old as old. The original structure of the architecture is largely unchanged. Firstly, the bricks are kept. If the bricks are too old, they are reinforced with steel. There's a street in Siguan called Granite Street. The granite slabs in the alleyway are preserved. The nearby drainage system was approved. The middle part was retained while the color of both sides of the road was repainted. The materials are original, but the water and electricity system are improved. The electrical wires are not exposed. They are all hidden below the ground. After the renovation, the natives of Shiguan were allowed to live in their own homes, so the culture of the neighborhood could be saved. 
Many well-known Cantonese opera actors used to live here, so it was dubbed Cantonese Opera Street. Enning Road has been a dwelling place for Cantonese opera artists. That's because the Cantonese Opera Academy was located here. The performers and people working in the Academy live nearby. About 10 years ago, the government established a Cantonese Opera Art Museum that displayed the costumes, culture, the history and the artists. In 2009, Cantonese opera was included on UNESCO's list as an intangible cultural heritage of humanity. Apart from the Cantonese opera, there are many other examples of intangible cultural heritage in Guangzhou. In 2020, parts of the street in Yongqing Fan were turned into Guangzhou's first intangible cultural heritage area. It allowed masters of traditional arts and crafts to set up their workshops here. Currently, there are 12 master workshops, including porcelain making, Cantonese embroidery, ivory carving, and stone carving. There are 12 items that are part of Guangzhou's typical cultural heritage. The process of setting up a workshop here is that the heir or the successor submits an application, then the government gives them a test. If they pass the test, then they are allowed to operate their business here. They have to take a test every year to see if they can achieve some targets. If they do, the government offers them rent concessions. Wu Wan Hoi is a master of making Guangzhou rice noodles. He is also secretary for the Li Wan Intangible Association. The association holds intangible art classes for the public on a regular basis. Today, the association has arranged a workshop to experience Guangzhou clay molding. This is great. If there is no publicity or activities, it is impossible to experience making these kinds of items. We've seen them often in the street, but we didn't know much about them. With this kind of workshop, we can understand more about the Guangzhou clay molding and our culture. It's meaningful for the younger generation. It is a scenic spot. It is also a cultural center. Usually, tourists tour around and take pictures when they go to a scenic area. We want to promote our culture. When the tourists come to Yongxin Fang, they can experience traditional arts and crafts such as clay molding, ivory carving. Then, they won't just browse around, take a few pictures and then leave. Yongqing Fan is rated as a national grade 4A tourist spot. Also, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited the area, which made it very popular. That helps the intangible cultural heritage businesses. Yongqing Fan is a famous old town in Guangzhou. When tourists explore the old town, they will definitely come to Yongqing Fan. Actually, individual tourist spending power is not so strong. But we have big clients. We accept orders and mass produce our items. Our clients place a massive amount of orders when they find the items they favor. Our business is good. We have many clients from different parts of the country. For instance, the Guangzhou Porcelain Cups, we received over 100 orders from five and six star hotels. Apart from the 12 intangible heritage workshops, many other trades have also been attracted to Yongqing Fan. In 2017, Ivan One came from Meizhou to set up a tea business. Beijing and Shanghainese people come to Yongqing Fang because it is an intangible heritage shop. I would be losing out if I don't come to Yongqing Fang. It is an intangible heritage shop and many masters gather here. Many love to set up a shop selling traditional cultural items. But there's a vetting scheme. The right brands are selected. Guangzhou is the most liberal city in China. It welcomes many businesses to the city. Apart from traditional Guangzhou culture, we also have items like Foshan porcelain and coffee and milk tea from other cities. Even some trendy drinks are available here. If they taste nice and the price is reasonable, then there will be a market for them. Yongqing Fan has been expanding over the past few years. Eateries, bars and concept stores have also opened. Now the construction of Phase 3 is underway 
and more hotels will be built here. 咁我相信隨住個體量嘅加大，遊客行嘅地方多，即係嚟依度。With a larger area, tourists won't just spend one day here; they'll stay two or three days. This is our goal. We have hotels, restaurants, and intangible heritage culture. Our infrastructure, facilities are improved. I hope they will stay longer to try our local chicken casserole, wonton noodles, rice noodles, ivory carving, and porcelain making. That is what we want to achieve. This is Lucien Freud, or rather his self-portrait. Born a hundred years ago, he was known as one of the most successful artists of the 20th century. He was also the grandson of psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. At the Freud Museum in London, an exhibition is now dedicated to the painter and his famous family, a theme that runs throughout all the items on display. As he said, all my work is autobiographical because it's about people I know and places that I know. Um, obviously, uh, people his, he was closely related to come into it quite a bit, uh, especially his mother, but also uh, many of his children. The largest painting, originally intended as a portrait of his daughter, Rose Boyt, depicts family growth. Her stepson, Alex, also found a place in the frame. He wears a Jimi Hendrix t-shirt. But there was a last minute addition to the family portrait. She was pregnant. It radically changed the picture. Next to paintings are display cases filled with books owned by Freud. One of them features a handwritten note quoting French novelist Gustave Flaubert. Freud's artistic legacy also includes book cover designs for books written by his children, Esther Freud and Susie Boyd. Other highlights of the exhibition include a section dedicated to Lucien Freud's interest in horses. This photo features him next to the horse model he depicted looking at the painting. And right below stands the only sculpture by Lucien Freud known to survive. Again, it features a horse, although this one only has three legs. The Freud Museum is housed in Lucien Freud's grandfather's home. On the ground floor is Sigmund Freud's study. Above the sofa, where he used to receive his patients, is a painting of Lucien Freud's mother, Lucy Freud with whom Lucien had a difficult relationship. We really wanted to just make the point that, you know, all families are complicated. Uh, this is something that Sigmund, Lucien's grandfather, investigated in a very radical and revolutionary way. Sigmund's and Lucien's insights into family dynamics are still ones that resonate today. That's the show. Thanks for watching. Next week, how local companies are investing in new energy vehicles to fight climate change. See you then. Good night.